right, well, you know, I'm Trevor Green, and I was born on the 30th of June, 1937. So I'm a, a baby at the beginning of the war, but uh, when 1945 came, I'm close on to eight. So during that period, I have got a fair recollection of what it was like to be uh, in Jersey during the occupation by the Germans. Um, my first recollection, really, of, of the islands is being told by my mother well, when I was about five that the island had been bombed by the Germans uh, in St. Helia and the Laroque, and a number of people had, had been killed as a result of it. Um, that surprised me because I was under the impression, as time went on in my life, that the island were, had been declared a demilitarized zone. Uh, but obviously that uh, message didn't get through to everybody in the German Air Force. The uh, life, you know, as a young boy, uh, living in close proximity to the Germans, because there was one of the uh, houses close by, which was a barracks, and there were uh, 50 Germans there, and they used to patrol each day and each night around our home, and so I got used to seeing Germans, um, and as a young boy, always on the scrounge for something, and they were very kind to me. Uh, they weren't aggressive in any way. By that time, uh, in the 1943, the hardline Germans, who actually came uh, on uh, the original flight, were high-grade Germans. They were the, the elite of the German army. And by mid-1943-44, we were dealing with uh, elderly gentlemen, all right, young boys, and uh, they were the ones who didn't really want to be uh, in Jersey, and so they were very sympathetic uh, to the populace on that. I was put into a situation uh, as time went on, which my mother explained to me later, where my father had been wounded in Crete and uh, taken prisoner and was in Germany and uh, they found out where he came from and they communicated with the authorities in Germany and so uh, they, came, they sent messages to the island to my mother which stated categorically via the German authorities here you are to abide by the law of uh, the Germans and uh, be very very careful what you do as a result of that, my brother, who was uh, 16 at the time, was told in no uncertain terms, don't get involved with anything, otherwise it's going to cause problems, A, for your mother, and B, for your father, who's in Germany. And the, the English authorities on, in, uh, in, in Germany, where my father was, and the prison of war camp, they told him in no uncertain terms, don't get involved with anything that we're doing uh, in the camp as far as escape is concerned because your wife and children are at the mercy of the Germans. And that really upset, as you can appreciate, us. And we took on a different kind of attitudes towards the Germans. Uh, we just, we would had to be compliant with everything that they did. So what was I doing as a, a young boy? Well, um, one of the great thrills really was to go into the big German bunker at Millard's Corner. Uh, and it was right, quite something to see all the guns and all the things like that, especially for a young boy at my age. And I used to go there with my cousins. And very uh, occasionally, the Germans would give us bread because uh, we were stuck, you know, we didn't have the food. So that was quite an exciting time in the eyes of a young, a young Jersey boy. Um, one distressing occasion in 1944, uh, when things were very, very hard indeed, uh, the ladies would go low water fishing uh, and principally to get um, uh, limpets and bring them back. 
Now we we used the young boys and the girls. We used to go with our parents into the rocks, and on one occasion we were lagging behind everyone, and the Germans closed the steps and they dropped a, a great big barrier down, and we were on the beach, and our mothers were on the road, and the Germans were, and they would not let us back up. And so there we, we were there crying our eyes out. Mothers were at the top, they're crying out, well, what are we going to do? And the Germans would not lift the barrier. So we were stuck on the beach, and we had to go right the way down past Millard's Corner and climb our way into a, a, a garden of one of the fishermen's homes down there. So that, that caused a problem. Uh, it didn't change my attitudes toward the Germans. Uh, I thought they were really nasty at that stage in time. You know, as, uh, as I grew older, the, the main problem affecting us was the lack of food, the lack of food, um, and, how, and how you could survive on a Swede, which uh, you had for breakfast, dinner, and tea. Because we were in an unfortunate position in many aspects. The townspeople didn't have the facilities, really, to grow their own food, or very limited although there were a number of allotments around, but the farming community and those in the country uh, were better off, were better off. Um, so that was always the, the problem and thing on my mother's mind, how to feed my growing sons uh, at that stage. And of course, uh, we used to go with her to the um, kitchens which were set up to uh, cook your meals and a meal would be uh, in quite something uh, to be cooked. And uh, I can remember on numerous occasions going there with a tin tray with half a dozen to a dozen potatoes to be cooked in the communal kitchen. Being young, one thing that our contribution to uh, that was to collect firewood. We used to go out you know, collecting firewood. But one of the big problems there, the Germans, you had to have a license from the commandant's office if you're going to go cutting wood. And, and trees could not be just cut down just like that. Well, one occasion we were lucky enough, we saw this lovely tree and we cut it down and, and covered it up with ferns and grass like that with the intention of coming back later to get this wood and things like that. Well, we went back later, only to find half a dozen Germans there. We were caught by the scruffs of our necks, and I don't know what happened and what was said to us, but they really, really, if I can use it, you know, uh, scared us right. And they confiscated the wood, and apparently the only way you could cut down trees was by having a, uh, uh, an order, signed order, from the, the German authorities. Uh, but we almost had the tree. So things were getting there, coal was running short, and I can remember my mother uh, and my auntie, they had uh, an old cart, and they went to the gas works, because the gas company were selling off tar, uh, which you could bring back home and make um, blocks uh, for, for the fire. And it, it, that, uh, that was really something. And, and as a young boy, to get involved in that was quite exciting. But only on reflection did I realise that it was quite something, you know, not having heat. Uh, you had to resort to all sorts of ways to heat. And then the other problem at the time, in the latter part of 1944, was the uh, turning off of the gas and the electricity, you know, the gas and electricity. The, uh, other thing is the, the lack of uh, facilities for us, uh, especially uh, clothing. It was a hand, hand you down thing. We used to, you know, as soon as a shirt or a jumper had been worn and it was too small for, uh, within the family area, it was circulated around relations and things like that. Um, I can remember on one uh, item which was that we were given wooden shoes. So yeah, we, uh, shoes was a big problem, and these are sabots made uh, of wood, 
uh, with rubber from the tires of the vehicles. And we those these are for um, you know a, a, a male um, to get a new pair of shoes or sabots. They had to go before a committee, believe it or not, and apply for new shoes. For new shoes, well, <coughs> excuse me. I had a pair of these things uh, to go to school, and we used to uh, carry our shoes to school. And only put them on when we were in school. When we finished school, we would come back home. But we all had sobos, you know, the the wooden shoe. The getting news around the islands was a bit of a, uh, a problem because by mid-1944 all radios had been confiscated. Uh, there were a number of good people who were able to hide them in their properties and cir circulate some of the news, but generally speaking uh, news was very, very difficult to come by. Uh, we knew that uh, problems were being faced by the Germans because their attitude changed. They became very scary and a lot of them were uh, left the islands to go to the uh, Russian front, uh, which uh, you know, we were delighted at, I can assure you. Um, the next thing we heard on, you know, n on numerous occasions, uh, British aircraft flying around the island and we know a number of aircraft dropped bombs at various places. There were, ac you know, there were uh, accidents and gunfire. So we knew that we weren't standing uh, in Jersey idle. And um, the, by the mid uh, of June 1944, we were getting desperate in many ways. But our morale was lifted by the Battle of Normandy, you know, June the 6th. Uh, we heard all the planes, the gunfire, uh, the, in fact, overhead came down the uh, pieces of um, metal uh, chaff. chaff, chaff, that's right, chaff. So we knew something was going on, and of course, the morale of the island went up, we're going to be liberated and liberated. But sadly, that wasn't, that wasn't true, and of course, St. Malo was heavily bombed by the Americans, and that's where we got our, our food supply from, mostly. And so then that period started to be very, very bad, very, very bad. During the, the previous time, um, I encountered, sadly, the, the Russian slaves who, who were brought over here. They were in a terrible, terrible state. I was lucky to, be, to see them, um, because at Millard's Corner there was a, a, a railway station, one of the side stations, and uh, I can recall on two occasions down there seeing these people shuffling along, um, you know, in sacks, nothing on their feet, and I was told by my cousins, you know, they were the, the slaves, and they really were treated with mumbling, you know, and that. And as they went by, uh, we tried to throw food to them, I, you know, my aunties were with them because we were on just on the side of the railway track near the FBP, FB f playing fields, the FB playing fields. So, liber you know, liberation of Europe was on its way, but we started on the decline for the next nine months, ten months of really going into great difficulty, great in, in all aspects, the lack of food, illness uh, and things like that. So that was a very bad time. And, you know, I'm now seven, seven and I can appreciate what's going on more than anything else. Uh, still, we still kept in contact um, as much as we could in a friendly way with the, the garrison at uh, Millard's Corner and also up by Green Island. We used to spend a lot of our time uh, in the, on the beach, um, going down, uh, foraging for food uh, in the rocks. You know, we used to get crabs to bring back to uh, make a soup. Uh, limpets were one of our main main things. And in those days, luckily enough, at the time, you, there were little cat and nine tails we we should bring back. So if we were lucky, you know, a, a catch would be. Uh, uh, most welcomed by 
my, my mother and my aunties and a, and a few people around the little area that we are, especially the limpets. And, uh, and the other thing that sustained us was the Swedes, you know, the Swedes. Um, I got to know Swedes more than anything else. You know, breakfast, dinner and tea, fried, baked, thing. But that was a sustainable food and that kept us going. So there we are, we're going on now, you know, the end of uh, 1944 and relief came in the, the Red Cross ship, the Vega. That was, you know, wonderful to think we've got food. And I have, uh, I didn't bring it down, but I have got one of the boxes of, of them. And then we had our food, the distribution. The Germans, in actual fact, were quite, you know, quite surprised that they should get so much food in. And there was a lot of pilfering at one stage uh, by the Germans, although it was never revealed, but they did get, a, uh, you know, some of the food uh, away. So that saved us in 19, you know, the January 1945. That was our saving grace on that. Um, by that time, you could tell from the attitude of the Germans um, that things weren't going according to their plan. And, uh, you know, they were, they were in serious trouble, food. Um, the slaves and the people, the, work, the trot workers, there was a lot of uh, disease, a lot of illness, and a lot of those people died. A lot of those people died. And very sadly, some of the, the Russian slaves and other European slaves died and uh, they were just buried in lime pits, buried in lime pits, something like that. But the Germans were lack of food. Somalo was in the hands of the Americans. Um, what could we do? We just had to save uh, the time for liberation. And there it was on the, on the, the doorstep on uh, the 9th of May, 19, you know, 1945. Wonderful, wonderful. I, with, uh, with uh, my mother and my brother, we went down to the Pondor Hotel, which was the center point for the, the, the arrival of the, the uh, British Tommies. And as you know from your thing, they uh, went into the Pondor Hotel and raised the Union Jack. First of all, they raised the Jersey flag in the harbour master's office, you know, and which is now reacted every year. So we were liberated, we were liberated. Um, and I think I had my first sweet from a Tommy, because my mother said, uh, words to the effect, oh, his dad is a soldier, and he gave me some sweets. One of the greatest uh, memories of liberation, strange it may seem, was an orange. We never had oranges, although they, they did arrive in the island, all right, and if you were in lucky enough to purchase them. But I never saw an orange. But I know in the market there was a great big sign, you know, Jaffa's oranges and things like that. And eventually I had an orange. And I, I think a lot of us, you know, took it to bed and didn't know what to do with it. But it was an orange. And that was one of the greatest delights after the occupation was to have an orange, to have an orange. So we've got a lot to be thankful for uh, in many aspects. Uh, you know, when you, when you read and hear about how other parts of Europe suffered under the Germans, I know a lot of about five or 600 non-Jersey-born people were uh, evacuated into uh, England, uh, into Germany. Um, so we were all right in many, many aspects on that. And uh, we got by as best we could. And uh, I'm pleased and proud to say that I'm, I'm an occupation boy. An occupation boy.